Dr. Hassanpour began his training in computer engineering at Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, followed by a Master of Math in Computer Science from the University of Waterloo. He then attended Stanford University and received his PhD in Electrical Engineering and Biomedical Informatics in 2012. Following that, he spent two years as a research engineer at Microsoft before returning to Stanford as a postdoc at the Center for Artificial Intelligence in Medicine and Imaging. In 2015, Dr. Hassanpour joined the faculty of Dartmouth College in the departments of Biomedical Data Science, Epidemiology, and Computer Science, and quickly ascended to the rank of Associate Professor in 2019. <clears throat> he has since developed a productive research group uh, that focuses on developing AI methods for the advancement of precision healthcare. Much of his lab's work is focused on the application of deep learning to images in the radiology and, and pathology domains. Additionally, his lab has applied natural language processing to a variety of medical report types, and he has collaborated in the creation of digital interventions for substance abuse and depression. This work has led to at least 33 journal papers, 23 conference papers, and of these 14 have, have been published in the last 18 months. In recognition of his breakthroughs in digital pathology, he was the recipient of the Agilent Early Career Professor Award in 2019. In addition to his research, which we uh, surely will hear more about today, Dr. Hassanpour also has a very strong record of service teaching and mentorship. This includes uh, service on the editorial board of Jamia Open and as a program committee member on several informatics meetings, such as the Clinical uh, Natural Language Processing Meeting and the AMIA Informatics Summit. He's also a standard mem standing member of the NIH Clinical Data Management and Analysis Study Section and sits on the Federal Advisory Committee for the Department of Veteran Affairs. Finally, Dr. Hassanpour has a strong record of service to the university, which has included being a founding member of Dartmouth's Geisel School of Medicine Diversity Council. In addition to many other responsibilities, he also serves on the School of Medicine's Faculty Council and on the Committee of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. I'm sure that all of you are as excited as I am today to hear about Dr. Hassanpour's work and his views on artificial intelligence as applied to histopathology. So let us welcome Dr. Saeed Hassanpour. Thank you very much, Toby, for this very kind introduction and your kind words. I'm really um, excited to share um, our research and our uh, recent work and the application of artificial intelligence in digital pathology and characterization of uh, histology uh, images. Before I forget, I should mention, please stop me at any, any time if you have any questions. Um, I do not have a uh, meeting immediately after this presentation, so I should be able to um, either answer your questions during this presentation and also if you prefer we can talk um, and discuss afterward. Also I try to you know take pauses and ask for questions after uh, different sections uh, of this presentation. But to start um, as you already um, see if I can get started. Okay, so as you already probably know, there has been a tremendous amount of progress in the domain of artificial intelligence in the last decade. So here I um, listed some of these um, achievements and milestones in the last 10 years for, for AI. And this progress has created many um, new opportunities and applications in different domains. So given these new opportunities and this progress in AI, my lab works on, uh, build, on building novel machine learning methods and uh, multimodal data analysis uh, methods to support uh, precision health. We have different types of research in my group. On um, one side, we work on uh, the application of computer vision and machine learning for analyzing medical images like uh, radiology images and histology images. I'm going to talk more today. And also on the other side um, and type of research, we work on natural language processing and uh, information extraction from electronic health records and clinical notes. And the uh, overall goal is to combine information from these different um, data sources and information sources to support uh, personalized health. So given my limited time today, I'm going to talk about um, using deep learning for histology image analysis. And as you probably uh, already know, deep learning is a subfield of uh, machine learning and AI, and is the underlying technique for many breakthroughs, recent breakthroughs in AI. So um, I want to first give a little bit of motivation that why histology image analysis is important, although for some of 
for people like Toby and others that are already active and very accomplished researchers in this domain, this introduction is not necessary. I just want to a few minutes to spend uh, on, the, on the motivation of this research. So histological classification and, class, uh, and classification of uh, pathology slides is an important factor in um, uh, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of many uh, different diseases, especially in cancer patients. But this classification and characterization is a subjective and difficult task. I usually compare um, this task to finding a green ball in a football stadium using uh, Google Maps software. Also, uh, I should mention a large number of histology slides are generated every day, and there is not enough number of pathologists to read them, especially in rural settings or in developing countries. So given these new opportunities and also shortcomings in this domain, uh, my lab works on building deep learning models for automated detection, classification, and prognosis in different types of uh, tumors and lesions. And here I listed some of these different types of cancer and uh, diseases that we have been worked on in the, uh, last, uh, in the last few years. Okay, so with this introduction, this is the overview of my talk today. My talk has two parts. The first part is uh, focused on clinical applications of histology image analysis. In this part, I'm mostly going to talk about collector polyps and collector cancer risk assessments. And I'm going to very briefly touch on other applications of histology image analysis that we have been working on in our group. In the second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about new uh, methodologies that we develop in this domain to specifically address the uh, challenges that we face for analyzing histology images. These uh, challenges basically mostly around digitization and um, hardware and computational bottlenecks and you know having access to large annotated data sets. So I'm going to talk about our attention-based approach and knowledge distillation, generative image translation and curriculum learning in the second part of this presentation. But first, uh, last, uh, let's talk about um, uh, 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 the clinical application on uh, collector polyps and collector risk assessment. Uh, this research is part of a bigger project that is funded by NIH. And the uh, overall um, uh, aim of these uh, project is about building clinically useful tool for classification of polyps on whole slide images. And also uh, the, the other aim of this project is focused on building comprehensive risk assessment tool for uh, um, collector cancer based on these histology images and also electronic health records. So first I want to give a little bit of um, background about collector polyps and collector cancer. As you probably already know, collector cancer is one of the most ty uh, common types of cancer in the US and broadly in the world. The majority of these um, uh, collector cancer cases arise from polyps. Polyps are these growth in lining of uh, colon or rectum, and it usually takes several years for a polyp to develop to be a cancer. So if a patient undergoes a screening and colonoscopy, these polyps can be resected and uh, cancer can be prevented. But the tricky thing about polyps is they reoccur. So after the baseline screening, the patient needs to undergo surveillance and follow-up colonoscopies uh, for this reoccurrence. And uh, the classification of polyps under the microscope from the baseline colonoscopy is an important factor in deciding the follow-up plan and the frequency of follow-up colonoscopies. But it turned out this classification is a, uh, is a difficult task. So uh, a few years ago, I did a literature review. I found these studies uh, which looked into the difficulty of this task. In this table, you can see the years of these studies and the number of polyps and uh, pathologists who were involved in these um, studies. And the last uh, column shows the Kappa score, which is a which is the measure of agreement between the pathologists who independently read these slides and classified the polyps. As you can see, uh, according the, uh, to these Kappa scores, um, the level of agreement is mostly in uh, poor uh, to fair range. So there is a significant amount of variability among pathologists 
in classification and, character and characterization of um, collectoral polyps. So in our project, uh, we uh, developed and evaluated a novel deep learning model for identification and classification of collectoral polyps on whole slide images. Our, in our study, we focused on the four types of polyps, which are the most common ones and are the major criteria in the US Mobile Society Task Force on Colorectal Cancer Screening and Surveillance Guidelines. Here you can see the names of these polyps and also a classic example of the patterns uh, for, for each polyp. Our study is a multi-institutional um, study, so we had access to both internal data set and external data set. Our internal data set includes more than 500 uh, FFPE, h &E slides, and, uh, we, and this is collected from Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. We partitioned this data set to training set, validation set, and internal test set. Uh, in our external uh, data set, we had uh, 238 HNES slides. We only use this external data set for external validation. This data set is coming from uh, collaboration with vitamin D calcium polyp prevention clinical trial. Uh, uh, this data set uh, is from 24 different institutions uh, across 13 states. So it's a very diverse data set. Also, I should mention that we also had access to a local pathologist diagnosis for and um, classification results uh, from associated uh, pathology reports for these slides. So our approach here is a supervised learning approach. So we needed uh, annotations for developing our model and also its evaluation. So we collaborated with five GI pathologists um, at uh, Darmus Hitchcock for, uh, to collect these annotations. In annotating our training set and validation set, we focus on region of interest annotation, and we ask our uh, pathologist collaborators to put region uh, bounding boxes around each polyp and classify them. For our internal and external test set, we ask five GI pathologists independently read each slide and classify the polyp under the slides, and we. Uh, we established a ground truth label by taking the majority vote among these five GI pathologists. So here is an example of a region of interest annotation for a sample slide from our training set. This slide shows the data flow in our study. And you can see here an internal data set was used for de model development and the internal evaluation. And our external data set was used only for uh, external evaluation of our model. So as you probably already know, these histology images are very large, are very high resolution. So given our current hardware, it's not possible to analyze them all at once. So we developed a, a sliding window approach and we broke a, a whole slide image, image into these fixed size patches and we trained a deep learning model to classify every patch. We uh, freely and publicly released our uh, pipeline, our code base for this whole slide um, uh, uh, analysis approach on GitHub and it's quite popular. So after patch level classification for whole slide uh, classification, we use the decision tree to identify the whole slide label based on the distribution of the classified patches. This hierarchical classification is based on how pathologists make this diagnosis uh, in clinical practice. And our thresholds here are learned based on grid search and cross validation. So for evaluation, uh, we use the majority vote of uh, five GI pathologists uh, as our ground truth. And also we compare the results of our model to local pathologist diagnosis at the point of care. This table shows the overall evaluation results in our, our, uh, our both internal and external data sets. Um, here you can see also its comparison to local pathologist performance. We measured common standard machine learning metrics, accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity for each type of polyp and overall. As you can see, according to, this, to these metrics, um, uh, our, the performance of our model is either slightly better um, than the pathologist in uh, the, for each type of polyp and overall, or the performance is pretty uh, close uh, uh, to each other. So we ran a statistical test that showed that the difference between the performance of our model and local pathologists on both data sets 
are is not statistically significant. So we stated that our model is on par, its performance is on par with the local pathologists on both data sets. We also ran error analysis as and as you can see in these confusion matrices, the type of error that our model makes and also uh, pathologists make in uh, in uh, uh, in clinical practice is quite similar. Uh, we also implemented an, uh, a simple visualization approach in which we highlighted the patches that contributed the most to whole slide labeling and classification results. So pathologists can review them and confirm and verify our results. Also, we integrated this deep learning model with the, and this visualization with an easy to use gra graphical user interface. So pathologists can use uh, this tool in clinical setting reading these slides. So as a next step, we were interested to uh, study and measure the impact of this AI augmented digital system on the performance of uh, pathologists in clinical practice. So last year, we ran a crossover uh, clinical trial to uh, measure the, the effect of this tool on accuracy and assessment time of pathologists uh, for reading uh, colloquial polybus slides in uh, clinical practice. This is the overview of our crossover study. It has two arms. One arm is using, uh, is reading a slides using microscope. This is a stethoscope. And the other arm is using our AI augmented digital system. We recruited 15 pathologists across New Hampshire and we randomly assigned them to one of these arms and we asked them to read 100 collector polybus slides using one of these tools. And after at least 12 weeks of uh, washout period, we asked the pathologist to read the same set of slides in a shuffle order using the alternative approach. Uh, this slide shows the overall impact of uh, our digital uh, system on the accuracy of the pathologist in this study. Overall, um, the accuracy of the pathologist increased from 73.9% to 80.8%. And this improvement was statistically significant. On the other hand, as we expected, uh, uh, using our uh, AI augmented digital system for reading the slides, it slowed down the pathologist a little bit. And this was uh, with 8.8 .8 seconds per slide on average. And this uh, slowdown was true for each type of, for all types of polyps and also all pathologists at different training levels. But the encouraging point here is the time difference in classification decreased substantially as the user's experience progressed with our system. So here, as you can see, uh, the reading time of the last 20 slides is almost half of the reading time of the first 20 slides. But they, when the pathologists use the microscope, the reading time didn't change that much. So we are hoping that as pathologists use our tool, our digital tool uh, more and more, and they become more uh, familiar with the system, the reading time improves uh, even further. We also ran a standard use, uh, software usability studies using surveys, and the results that we got from these surveys and this usability study was overwhelmingly positive and encouraging. So as the next steps, uh, we are currently using, um, we are currently working uh, on integrating other metadata and clinical information to improve the results uh, of our uh, model. Also, we are working on extending uh, our uh, tool to other related patient outcomes and diagnosis, um, uh, related diagnosis. And also we are working on extending our clinical trial. So uh, now I want to very briefly talk about a few other clinical applications that we have been working on, but not at the same uh, level of detail, just touch on them. And, um, and I'll, but I will be happy to go in more detail in our one-on-one meetings or after this presentation. So uh, the first application is using deep learning for classification of long adrenal carcinoma subtypes. Um, here we show that our deep learning model can successfully identify both um, uh, uh, major and minor subtypes and patterns on uh, slides with mixed histologies. We also uh, publicly release as dataset with its associated annotations uh, online and GitHub to promote research and collaboration in this domain. 
In another project, we focused on building a deep learning model for renal cell carcinoma classification. Uh, in this project, we focused on showing the generalizability of our model on uh, data coming from different data sources and also different types of slides. So we wanted to build a model that uh, can uh, work on not only resection slides and also on biopsy slides. And as you can see here our, uh, in these visualizations, our approach was quite successful in identifying renal cell carcinoma classification patterns, uh, classification and identifying the associated patterns, um, both resection and uh, biopsy slides. In another project, we build a deep learning model for identification of salient, identification of salient disease in biopsy slides. And finally, I want to tell you about these projects in which we use histology images and deep learning for predicting prognosis and IDH mutation status in uh, lower grade glioma. In this project, we show that uh, combining information that are extracted uh, from histology images from um, using deep neural networks uh, and combining that with uh, other clinical and uh, demographic information uh, improve the prediction performance of our model. So uh, this concludes the first uh, part of this um, presentation, which was mostly uh, focused on clinical applications. Uh, I want to uh, pause here before I start the second part of my presentation, which mostly is about uh, developing new methodologies uh, to see if there is any question. Okay, seems there's no question. If but uh, in Dr. Hassenworth, I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, but I, this is really cool. I'm curious um, with your increase in like your decrease in overall time for diagnosis, that also maybe implies that you have an increase in trust in your model. And I'm curious what um, efforts you're making towards identifying uh, out of distribution samples that might come in and might kind of you know create a problem in your diagnostic pipeline. Yeah, so uh, this is the very good question. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I, there was a one short like kind of breakup in your voice. I didn't really get the. So I, I got the second part, which was about out of distribution. What was the first part um, of your talk? Uh, so my first part was just saying that, yeah, with your decrease in time for classification, that means that your users are trusting your system more probably. Oh, okay. um, and so I'm curious, you know, yes. you're getting basically um, confirmation bias effect right. of those users. Yeah, well, this is the, actually, <laughs> this is the, uh, both, both part of, actually both questions are very, very good. So the first part that is about, you know, this uh, trusting our approach, this is another domain that I'm really in, uh, interested in and I'm uh, currently working with our collaborators, which is about trusting, uh, uh, is about like establishing trust between pathologists and AI. We definitely saw uh, this effect that you mentioned. So when our tool is correct, is actually, you know, it, uh, it definitely has an impact on, uh, improving the accuracy of the result, but in a few cases that our tool actually is inco incorrect, we actually saw the negative impact that this uh, approach can have, and you know, uh, to to basically to uh, introduce bias in the performance of the pathologist. So uh, we are currently working with our pathologists to to basically so uh, to address that. One of them is to uh, in basically improving the accuracy of these models to make less and less uh, mistakes. And that's the first part that I'm talking about with including, you know, uh, different, uh, uh, different metadata and clinical data to improve the results further. Also, I'm going to talk about how we, in the second part of this talk, that we focus on uh, building models that are pretty good in classification of difficult cases. This is the basically the second topic the, about the image uh, translation, difficulty translation that I'm going to address that. But uh, the other, in the, in the other way that we basically uh, talk about it with our pathologists is about like shortcomings that these models have. So in our model, uh, we also have the, in our tool, we also have the option for pathologists to remove the annotation, this data augmentation, so they can look at it with a you know uh, uh, clean slate, and uh, they can introduce the augmentation as a second opinion uh, later after they already independ uh, independently 
establish their opinion so they can use it as their basically second opinion. So there are different ways that uh, my colleagues and I were thinking and uh, discussing this, but this is the very quick question. The, the other way is about the distribution and out of uh, you know distribution samples. So we actually try to um, uh, try to basically uh, when we are uh, basically selecting our data, we try to uh, have a re uh, representative sample of 100 uh, polyps. But uh, again, in the I think in when I talk about um, image uh, uh, translation, uh, our work on image translation, I'm going to address this that how we make our model uh, uh, perform well, not only on common cases, also on cases. Um, are rare cases and difficult and coordinate cases and cases that are difficult to classify. So just uh, hopefully in a um, in 20 minutes or so, um, I will answer your question. Let's see, I see some posts in the chat. Thank you. you know, um, what did you use as a gold standard in the polyp studies? to calculate sensitivity and specificity. So uh, we basically gave these uh, slides to five joint pathologists to independently uh, classify them and we established the ground truth based on the majority vote between these five, five joint pathologists. Mentioned the, uh, okay, Larry, may, uh, yeah, I, actually he, he actually answered this question. Thank you very much, Larry. Sorry, I didn't see your response. Okay, uh, great. So, um, let me um, move forward and talk about our methodologies that um, we developed, new, new methodologies that we developed in this domain to address some of the challenges um, that we face specifically to histology image classification. So first I'm going to talk about our attention-based approach. So this is sliding window approach that I talked about in the first part of this presentation works pretty well in many clinical applications. But it requires this region of interest annotations that uh, are uh, very time consuming from, uh, for pathologists to generate. It requires a lot of energy, expertise, you know. So it, it kind of um, limits the scalability uh, of, of our approach. So to address this challenge, we uh, propose an attention based approach that. Um, doesn't require this region of interest annotation and also the heuristics on top of the distribution uh, of the uh, classified patches to label the whole slide. And it's trainable end-to-end -end using only whole slide level labels. So this attention-based approach uh, automatically learns the important regions of the slide and make the whole slide level classification using um, these uh, 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 identified important regions. So this is the overview of our attention-based approach. We first overlay a grid on the whole slide and we use a convolutional neural network or CNN to extract features from each cell of this grid. Then we use a 3D convolutional layer to learn an attention map. Uh, in this attention map, we assign a weight to each cell of this grid based on its features and its content and its uh, importance for our whole slide classification task. Then we use this feature map for a uh, holistic representation of the features on the slide. So uh, we use this um, attention map weights for weighted averaging of features uh, across this grid. And we uh, finally use a fully connected neural network for uh, classification of whole slide based on this holistic representation. So uh, we applied and evaluated our um, approach on a data set uh, related to esophageal cancer. Uh, this data set includes uh, 379 HNES slides from Darmus Hitchcock. Here you can see its distribution across training set, validation set, test set. This slide shows the evaluation results of our model in comparison to the sliding window uh, approach. This is our baseline on 123 images in our test set. Our data set includes four classes, normal, bad esophagus with no dysplasia, bad esophagus with dysplasia, and adenocarcinoma. And here we measure accuracy, recall, precision, and the front score. So according to all of these metrics, the attention-based model um, outperformed a uh, uh, sliding window approach, the baseline, almost in all uh, cases. But the very important point to note here is the sliding window approach 
uses this region of interest and annotations that's very hard and uh, time consuming. Uh, it's very hard to get and it's very time consuming uh, to generate. And our attention based model only uh, relies on whole slot labels that are much easier to obtain and to parse from associated pathology reports. We can also use the attention map for visualization of uh, related and important features for whole slot classification tasks. And we can, as you can see here, we can use this uh, visualization to uh, show the important features to pathologists so they can review and verify our results. So now I want to talk about using knowledge distillation and um, self-supervision for efficient histology image classification. So this work is uh, motivated by current challenges and bottlenecks in digital pathology around characterization and classification of histology slides. Uh, first of all, um, first challenge is the digitization challenge, as you probably already know. Uh, digitizing these uh, slides at high resolution uh, requires major investment in time and resources. Also, we are currently limited by the capacity of uh, our hardware uh, for analyzing these slides. And finally, I talked about uh, uh, the bottleneck of region of interest annotation, which is a slow, expensive, and requires high level of expertise. So our solution to address these uh, challenges is developing an accurate uh, model that operates on low resolution images using knowledge distillation and self-supervision. So because this model operates on low resolution images, uh, scanning these images and digitization is much easier and cheaper. And also because of the size and lower resolution, we can use uh, 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 we have easier time and we can use common hardware uh, for analyzing these histology images and also because we are using self-supervision we do not require as much label data so we will uh, uh, gaining uh, annotations and getting annotations become much easier so uh, before i uh, talk about our, our our project i want to give a little bit of background about knowledge distillation uh, and also self-supervision. Knowledge distillation is uh, transferring learning information between uh, models with different capacities. For example, we have a teacher model that operates on high resolution images and we have a student model that operates on low resolution images. And we want to translate learned uh, knowledge for pattern recognition and classification from this teacher model to the student model. And uh, a little bit uh, background about self-supervision. Self-supervision is a very hot topic right now in the domain of machine learning. And it's a form of unsupervised learning where data provides the super supervision. So we define a proxy loss and we use this proxy loss to uh, train a deep learning model that can represent uh, our data points very accurately. So, so it does a very good job for extracting features and uh, representing the data, uh, representing the data without having access to label data. So here is an example. We have a data set without label, without any ground truth labels, and we can artificially introduce these rotations to every data point. And we can train a deep learning model to predict the introduced uh, rotation for every uh, data sample that we have in our data set. And through this uh, training, uh, this deep learning model can become very good and efficient in terms of feature extraction and representing the data. And we can use this uh, uh, deep learning model that we train this way in another task, in our task of interest uh, for that uh, basically that we are interested in. So with this introduction, this is the overview of our resolution-based uh, knowledge uh, distillation with self-supervision. So we have two models, a teacher model that operates on high-resolution images and a, a student model that operates on low-resolution images. So uh, uh, in the knowledge distillation part of this, uh, this pipeline, we want to optimize the feature map loss by uh, minimizing the L2 distance of the extracted features uh, uh, in both models. So we want to make sure that extracted feature map is as close as possible 
in both, uh, at both high resolution and low resolution. We also have a classification module in both models uh, on top of this feature map. And in the self-supervision part of our pipeline, we want to optimize the classification loss by minimizing the KL divergence um, uh, on top of the classification results of these, uh, of these two models. So if you notice, we basically in our optimization, we compare the results of the teacher model to the student model. So we do not really requiring any label or any ground truth label, any um, you know, uh, expert generator label here. So we can basically uh, train and learn this feature extraction uh, network and classification modules only using unlabeled data, which is uh, quite useful when we do not have access to these, to the expertise or, or uh, to label data. So uh, we tested our approach on the data related to celiac disease. We also, in our experiment, we wanted to see the effect of the size of unlabeled data on the performance of our model. So we experimented with two uh, unlabeled, two basically sizes for unlabeled, for auxiliary unlabeled data. One with 300 images, the other one with almost 1,000 images. So uh, this figure shows the evaluation of our um, uh, evaluation results. So you can see the tested accuracy uh, at different uh, magnification level uh, levels. So this green line shows our baseline approach at different magnification levels. And this baseline approach doesn't use any knowledge of uh, distillation or self-supervision. These two lines show the performance of our uh, student model at different resolutions. And as you can see here, with adding, uh, adding more unlabeled data in our uh, training and in our uh, self-supervision, it uh, generally improves the performance of our student model. And this performance is more pronounced at lower resolution. The interesting point here is the student model at 5x uh, outperforms the teacher model at 10x magnification. But this is at 4x reduction at computational cost. Also at 2.5x magnification, our student model almost uh, achieved the same performance of, uh, in terms of accuracy of the teacher model at 10x magnification, but this is uh, with a 16x reduction in computational cost. Uh, since this experiment, we also replicated the result on two other data sets that show that the student model can achieve high level of accuracy with a significant reduction in computational cost. Okay, now I want to talk about our uh, generative image translation for histology data augmentation. And hopefully this actually will answer uh, uh, some of the questions that uh, uh, was brought up earlier about the coordinate cases or difficult cases. So uh, building deep learning models uh, for histology image classification requires a large balanced data sets. But uh, the distribution of, um, of classes in our data set uh, usually is skewed by the prevalence uh, of the subtypes and also by the you know, difficulty of having access to the data. So our solution to address this problem is building an image translation model for generating synthetic near real images for rare classes based on images for more common classes using CycleGAN. So we are hoping that use these generative images for these rare cases to uh, in training our deep learning model and improve our classification results. So a little bit about CycleGAN. CycleGAN uh, stands for Cycle Consistent Generative Adversarial Network. I'm not going to talk about this model in detail, but basically in general domain of computer vision, is widely has been used to translate images from a source domain to a target domain. For example, photos to Monet paintings or horses to zebras and vice versa. So our, we tested our idea here on collector poly data set. As you can see in this pie, ta, a pie chart, uh, tubular adenoma, uh, adenomas and sessile serrated adenomas uh, uh, compose uh, only 15% and 3% of our data set respectively. So here we try to use a normal clonic mucosa as our source domain and generate synthetic images 
uh, with features uh, from these rare classes to uh, basically uh, uh, to uh, as augmented data and also we use this augmented data to improve the performance of our model in, uh, in a classification task. So this uh, slide shows our pipeline for this generative image translation. In this pipeline, we introduce a path rank filter here, which is the pre-trained classifier that assigns the confidence score to our target domain images. And here we use this uh, pre-trained model or path rank filter to identify images with high confidence score as target domain images and only use these high confidence score images that are most representative of the target domain in our uh, training of the cycle can. So it turned out this filtering and, um, and using only high confidence target images uh, significantly improves the quality of the generated images. So here alpha is the portion of um, top target images that we use in our um, in our training and as alpha becomes smaller and smaller, it means that we become selective, more selective in our target domain images, the quality of generative images improves. So for evaluation, um, we perform a Turing test using four GI pathologists. So to each pathologist, we uh, show them a mix of um, 100 uh, real images and 100 synthetic images. And we ask them to independently review them and classify them as fake or real. So on right, you can see some details on this, on this evaluation um, for each type of polyp. But overall, at least half of the pathologists could not distinguish real and fake images at a statistically significant level. We also uh, studied the impact of using these synthetic images as uh, augmented data in, uh, on, in, tra in model training and performance of the resulting model. And as you can see in this ROC curve, uh, curves, the performance of the model significantly improved once we use these, augment these uh, synthetic images as augmented data during model training. So um, as you already know, and pathologists among us already appreciate, there is a large amount of variability in, classif in uh, classification, uh, variability in the difficulty of classification of histology images. And I think this is alluding to the uh, question that was asked earlier. So for our model to be truly uh, useful, uh, it should uh, not only perform uh, well on, nor on easy cases and you know, on typical cases, and also on hard to classify cases and difficult cases. So uh, to do that, we extended this uh, image translation pipeline to basically build a, a pipeline that generates synthetic near real hard to classify images based on easy to classify images using cycle GAN to improve classification performance on difficult cases. So to quantitatively uh, measure the difficulty level of classification for histology images, we either can use a, use a confidence score of a machine learning classifier, or we can use pathologist inner annotator agreement for, uh, for images. So in this uh, difficulty image translation, uh, I'm going to talk how we use the confidence score of a pre-trained model. And later I'm going to talk about how we use inner annotator agreement to uh, through curriculum learning to improve the performance of the models even further. Okay, let me stop. I saw something in the chat. Uh, for prediction of largest skewed balanced data set, you mentioned that only about 3% of your data were cancerous polyps. How many samples is 3%? What's the minimum recommended total case versus um, control sample input and imbalance sensitivity in order to get a uh, decent accuracy and uh, reproducibility or how would one calculate that? Okay, so I want to uh, first clarify the 3% if I, um, if I remember correctly, this is the part of cis ulcerated adenomas. Of, of course, we have different other, you know, tubular adenomas, tubular villus. villus. So we have different kind of adenomas that they are basically precancer. So this is not only only precancer type of polyps. So, but this is definitely one of the more 
more rare type of polyps. In terms of what, um, you know, what's the amount of right amount of data that's needed to build a reasonable and reliable uh, model, I think it's like really depend on the task and, you know, the, the complexity of the task and amount of overlap uh, that you have, you know, between different features. And so basically uh, we saw the good performance, you know, for uh, before. Um, so if you, if I, um, if I go back to our, uh, let me see, previous slide, for example, here we have a specific, uh, basically, uh, in, uh, test for HP versus SSA. This test set includes 39 cis-ulcerated adenomas and I believe 2061 hyperplastic HP images. So um, usually, um, you know, uh, what, we, what we do is like, we try to have a reasonable number, like a start with a reasonable number, given our like current timeline, the amount of like uh, time that we have access to data, we have access um, and the time we have access from pathologists. So this is usually around several hundred images. And, uh, and we basically, this is an iterative process. So you can basically start with, you know, and, and really, you know, start with a reasonable number for your test, that can be like you know a few hundreds, and see what happens. If the task is you know is is um, is not as challenging of some of these tasks, for example, this um, differentiate the differentiating between SSA and HP polyps, you can get a reasonable results. If if that's not the case, you usually can collect more data, or you can rely different like other approaches, like for example this um, uh, image translation and therefore data augmentation. So. So this is, I think, iterative approach and is, uh, is, uh, can be decided case by case. Uh, there is no closed form for power analysis for neural network methods. It's always in protocol, I say. Yes, thank you, Larry. Yeah, so we are actually, as Larry mentioned, we have this struggle that, you know, we have like uh, write grant papers, uh, grants and papers and you know usually people on the panel ask you well what's the power analysis these are usually like traditional bio statistic experts so as Larry mentioned usually we try to kind of show the the evidence from the previous studies that are like comparable to our study to show the you know vicinity about like the amount of uh, uh, data that is reasonable amount. Also, we rely on the preliminary studies that are related to this study. And you know, there's some maneuvers to actually show that uh, uh, basically amount of data that you have can, can get the reasonable results, but it's very empirical. Uh, actually, we are working on the pancreatic cancer right now, project right now. And I, I we basically went through uh, uh, as you mentioned, pancreatic cancer patterns, for example, tricky ones like lung adenocarcinoma project that I uh, mentioned earlier. This is another tricky, you know, project. So usually in these cases, we start with a few hundreds for pancreatic cancer. We actually got a very good result recently. And to give you uh, the honest, basically estimate, I think by around like uh, something around 500 images, we could actually get a pretty good result. Uh, um, normal like high grade and you know low grade and uh, I don't know carcinoma so we could basically um, uh, we can always basically talk about it after the presentation but yeah these are very uh, empirical ways to decide um, usually do not know till you get started so uh let's go back and uh yeah i was here i was just mentioning that in this project we use the uh, pre-trained model uh, classifier to identify, to basically stratify the difficulty of, um, of the slides for classification. And later I'm going to talk about how we use um, annotation agreement for, um, uh, for in curriculum learning to improve our model further. So this is the overview of the of our uh, difficulty translation pipeline. So similar to the previous pipeline, we have a pre-trained model that we call the scorer. We use the is confidence score to stratify uh, images to easy to classify images and hard to classify images and translate images from one domain to another domain using cyclecan. 
So uh, by, by tuning and changing the hyperparameter of this pipeline, we can also adjust the difficulty level of the generated images, as you can see in this sample. This uh, table shows the impact of using generated uh, hard hyperplastic images um, on the performance of the model while we use that, if you use that as uh, augmented data. So in comparison to a baseline model that doesn't use uh, these generated images, the, the AUC on test set improves significantly, um, not only on the uh, in easy images that have uh, high agreement level among annotator pathologists, also on uh, hard cases that had low level of agreement among pathologists, also overall, as you can see here. So, uh, the, so as you might know, uh, more, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, people use overlapping annotations to establish uh, ground truth uh, for um, images and for imaging data. So the question is, what else can we do uh, if we have access to these um, overlapping annotations and we can calculate annotation uh, agreement level for our data set. So, uh, the, so here, this is the uh, last uh, topic that I'm going to talk about today. And it's about using these annotation agreement levels in curriculum learning to improve the performance of the model even further. I want to just spend um, you know, a few seconds, uh, give you a little bit of background about uh, curriculum learning. Curriculum learning is, um, is, uh, is inspired by how humans uh, learn new tasks. So it starts slow and it first focus on easier aspe aspects of, the, of a task, and then it gradually increases the difficulty level during the training. So we um, applied our approach on the data set of our, uh, on our polyp data set. So in our data set, we have uh, two different types of polyps, HB and cisocerated adenomas, as you know, our GI pathologists can confirm. This is the difficult uh, differentiation in a GI uh, pathology. So we basically showed this set of slides to seven GI pathologists locally here at Dharmas Hitchcock, and we asked them to classify them. And using the annotation agreement, we can rank them based on their difficulty. So in this slide, the the, the images on two sides of a spectrum, when seven out of seven pathologists agree on the labels, these are easy to classify images. And the cases in the middle, when only four out of seven pathologists agree, these are hard to classify cases. So this is the overview of our uh, curriculum learning approach. So it has different stages. In the first stage, we train our model on easy cases. These are cases that seven out of seven pathologists agree on. So after that, we have the second stage. In this stage, we introduce a little bit harder images. So these are uh, in, in for two training. So these are images that six out of seven pathologists agree on the label and so on. In the next stage, we introduce a little bit harder images. And the last stage, we train the model on the whole data set. So here you can see the evaluation results and the comparison of our curriculum learning approach to a single stage training baseline and also to other curriculum learning approaches that use different ordering for training. And according to this um, area under the curve result on the test set, which is stratified based on annotator agreement, uh, we had a significant improvement in the performance of model uh, than using curriculum learning at all levels of difficulty, very hard, very easy, from very easy images to very hard images and also overall. So as major outcomes, um, you know, the readily available annotation agreement for different data sets can be used as natural proxy for difficulty of these um, image classification tasks. And we can use this proxy in curriculum learning to improve the classification results even further. We also released our data in this project with annotation agreement amongst seven GI pathologists publicly on, on GitHub, so other researchers can, uh, uh, can work and, and uh, hopefully we can collaborate in this domain. So I know I'm almost, um, 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 you know, um, at the end of uh, this one hour presentation, so I want to spend um, a few minutes, very briefly, talk about 
our current research directions in this domain. So first of all, I believe these deep learning models are most useful uh, when they provide assistance to pathologists as uh, clinical decision support systems. So uh, we are currently actively working on running other clinical trials and we're hoping to deploy these models in clinical practice uh, to help pathologists in reading the slides and in, in clinical settings. Also in all of the projects that I talked about, um, uh, today, they were focused on analyzing uh, HNE slide, um, HNE stain slides. But I should mention uh, we are interested to extending our methods to analyzing um, IEC stain images too. And we are currently running a couple of pilot projects in this domain. And these other uh, stainings can provide important uh, molecular information and biomarkers uh, for cancer prognosis and treatment. And also I want to briefly mention that we are actively working on combining information from imaging data, both histology images and also radiology and radiomics data to, uh, and combining that with molecular information and clinical information from EHR for comprehensive modeling to uh, inform uh, personalized care. So at the very end, um, I want to thank the member of my group who significantly contributed to the research projects that I talked about today. Also, I want to thank my colleagues uh, from the pathology department here at Dharma Sishkak, my collaborators and funding sources. So with that, uh, we thank you for your time and attention. I'll be answer, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Saeed. Um, if anyone has any questions, I know we're at the top of the hour, but uh, Dr. Hassan uh, great uh, graciously al allowed us to ask questions beyond the hour. So if those of you can stay, I think um, you could either raise your hand, put it in the chat, or just uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Green? Um, yeah, so so I think, you know, using the hard, uh, the cycle GAN to produce hard images and then training over the hard images is really interesting. I guess I wonder does it make the classifier less stable or does it make it more brittle? Or it feels like it has to have some cost of like changing those decision boundaries or is it essentially, it seems like a free win. Yeah, well, you actually point out at least, you know, at least in the cases that we saw in, in our basically, uh, in our application, we didn't see a effect on the stability of, um, of the deep learning model that we uh, trained um, using these uh, synthetic images. However, you're pointing out at the, you know, good point. So one of the, basically another um, uh, domain that we're actively working on is the stability, which is like in machine learning, people like talk about calibration. Like, you know, when we make a, like a certain prediction, how confident we are about this, like, you know, result and if the model is brittle or not. So we actually uh, work on the, on the basically using um, difficulty level, both from the confidence score and uh, of the pre-trained model and also annotation agreement for calibration this model to, uh, to improve the, um, to improve the basically stability of the model. And these uh, results are quite encouraging and right now it's under review uh, for publication. Unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to present it today, but we're happy to talk to you in our meeting later. Sure, please go ahead. Hi go there, on. how are you? Saeed, that you? was really a great presentation. I'm Ann Thor, I'm the chair of pathology and it's really delightful to have you visit with us today. So thank you. Thank you. I had two questions um, and they relate a little bit to the way we practice. We do a very high volume and a lot of them are minute um, samples. The cases, at least the images that you showed look like they were from surgical specimens. They were very well preserved. They were very well stained and similarly stained. A lot of our diagnostic work increasingly is on fragments or things that have damage due to lasers or due to pinch uh, biopsy methodologies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we also do an awful lot with cell blocks generated from uh, needle biopsies that are done with something from, a, say, an 18 gauge up to a 20 something gauge, maybe 25 gauge. So it's often fragmented, doesn't have that beautiful architecture that particularly for the diseases you were looking at is also so very helpful to us as pathologists. So I'm wondering, have you looked at, I guess what I would call 
less optimal type samples? Uh, and how much does the preservation and the architecture contribute to the statistical power of what you're doing? Yeah. And my second question relates to laboratories and how they stain things. We get a lot from the outside um, and the quality of staining, the intensity and protocols associated with staining is often very, very different at different institutions. Some are a lot more pink, some are a lot more blue, some are light, some are bad. And of course, frozen section also introduces a, 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 essentially a freezing artifact that also changes the staining characteristics and the preservation of the cells. Do those physical nuance that's part of our daily life that is difficult for us, and sometimes that's our toughest cases, the ones that aren't stained well or fragmented or not oriented right, does that, does that also really reduce the power of AI to interpret things? And have you considered some of those variables? Yeah, you actually pointed out very good points. These are very practical, actually, you know, problem challenges that we face definitely in these projects too. So uh, to go back to your question about like biopsy and, you know, when you do not have these like nice resection slides. In uh, multiple projects, um, I talked about our work on celiac disease and also renal cell carcinoma. We, we basically look into application of, um, application of these uh, approaches and biopsy slides as well as resection slides. So, uh, you know, to, to basically, to, to talk, to basically uh, give you a very brief answer to this question is usually uh, in our projects we use this very well like you know uh, uh, prepared and stained images for developing and training the model so when we try to really teach this algorithm what to look at so we can basically try and train them on high quality images and also our results show that once we have a very well trained um, uh, uh, model on high quality data they can actually identify those patterns on the on the basically on the image on the basically the whole slide images that may be coming from biopsy and do not have you know as much maybe tissue or smaller tissues uh, regarding the artifacts that you get from, for example, for frozen slides or, you know, the variations that you get for different protocols and staining protocols and preparation protocols, definitely we see that in, the project, in our, in our data sets too. I didn't go very detailed, so we have this pipeline for pre-processing and harmonization of the slides that we publicly released on our data, uh, on our GitHub, uh, on our lab uh, web, uh, website that we basically try to harmonize and remove these, um, you know, artifacts as much as possible. Also, we have doing um, very, ex so, the, and I, I, I understand um, that there is, uh, as we saw in our external evaluation and also eva uh, evaluating our model on frozen slides, we definitely see some kind of degree, uh, uh, like reduction uh, in the performance of model. That's not, that's unavoidable. Like that's, uh, uh, but still it is um, at uh, basically uh, because of this pre-processing, uh, it, it's not, uh, you know, uh, the reduction is not, uh, is, is, is acceptable. Also, I want to tell you about like this other very exciting research that we have been working on. I didn't again, I had a chance to talk about, I talked about this image translation from uh, easy cases to hard cases or from, you know, rare cases to uh, come from more common cases to more rare cases. We also build GAN models that translate images from uh, frozen slides to, you know, uh, to uh, FFP slides. So this is like equivalent to basically translating images uh, to reduce these artifacts that are coming from, you know, uh, preparing a slice of fresh frozen. Also, we did a similar thing for staining. So some of these about like we have the staining, we have a standard staining here at DHMC and we translate uh, basically um, we, we, we try to normalize the images using these scan images that, that you know, uh, that translate, translate images uh, from um, uh, from a source domain that prepared a different protocol, maybe different shades and different basic products, uh, staining protocols, and uh, translate them to more standard, uh, basically um, uh, basically coloring. Also, we have done similar thing. I um, I probably hopefully I will have a chance to talk about it tomorrow to translate images from HNE to IHC stain images. So as you probably already know. 
uh, IC staining is very expensive. We have a limited amount of um, uh, IC stained uh, slides here. So we can actually use these image translation models for to artificially stain them uh, the, uh, with different, basically, uh, well, we well, we different I C stain um, basically uh, biomarkers. So this is very uh, kind of exciting domain that we have been working on. Yeah, I was actually thinking if you you know let's say you get images in that don't have the same color balance or whatever. I mean it is possible with the technologies that you could do a color adjustment to at least try to reduce some of that thing. I also was super excited about your teacher and student. Um, data because that suggests, oh my God, I mean, the we have two RPOs, but you know, the amount of data it generates, the time that it takes, it's a pain in the in the rear, and I'm certainly no expert at it. Uh, but if you can do it with lower um, pixel uh, and data intensive images, that's pretty exciting to me. I, I, I'm happy to see Toby, who's actually just around the corner from me, but I haven't seen you yet today. I'm glad to see him shake his head too, because that really suggests you don't necessarily have to be at like a top academic center perhaps, or use a super fancy scanner to generate some benefit from this technology. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, this uh, work that I um, presented here, they are all inspired and motivated by the practical challenges that we have here and I faced in my own research. And some of it about exactly the same problem. So we are here, you know, in rural New England, like we relatively have a small number of data sets uh, in comparison to, you know, larger like center like Stanford and Harvard. So we basically try to use technology to overcome these bottlenecks like around having access to large, like gigantic amount of like digitized uh, data and, you know, annotating them. So, uh, so definitely I think like uh, this new methodology can address these practical challenges. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation and Thank nice you. to meet you. Yeah, nice meeting you too. Thank you. So, say so, very nice, very nice talk. This is Jim Castello. Um, I, have, um, I don't know if this would be a good or bad thing, but could you use some of the adversarial network data generation um, types of algorithms to predict new pathology? Yeah, I actually, this is something that we wanted to do uh, and from very early on, like for identifying for anomaly detection and for basically learning normal. So we basically, um, that was actually the, that was the first idea that we have using GAN and histology images, you know, trying to generate normal tissue in different, uh, you know, um, uh, for example, in lung cancer and try to basically, you know, we have this discriminator that identify normal versus abnormal. I, I want to say uh, we had limited, we saw that, using CNN, training a CNN, um, you know, in weekly supervised and also in fully supervised approach is outperforming GAN. So we definitely tried using GAN for classification and identification of different classes, but it was, uh, it was basically um, so par when we, we try uh, in, com uh, in comparison to using CNN directly for classification. That's why we basically try to combine GAN with CNN uh, to generate augmented data to improve CNN classification. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it would, be, it would be super cool if you had the ability to use those techniques to predict some novel pathology that might be present. And then you could say, go to the pathologist and say, hey, look for this, um, you know, morphological feature or something like that and see if you could find it within the, uh, within the samples uh, and it could potentially be some type of, you know. Yeah, yeah I think this is a very actually a good, great idea and something that we are actually actively working on when we do not have a specific like textbook, you know, associated feature and morphology in, in, in pathology textbooks. So for example, when we are looking at the patient outcome, like, you know, response to part uh, or to treatment or, you know, survival time. This is, uh, you know, we have grading and we have different, you know, patterns that are used as proxy, but like patient outcome, 
uh, there is not like these are very down the line and there is no specific like feature that associated with that. So we are here using, you know, uh, 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 weekly supervised approaches to identify, to basically predict this patient outcomes, like this prognostic, uh, extract this prognostic features that uh, probably is not known uh, it, it's not known, uh, it's not currently known to pathologists. Also, there, there has been some work in this domain to showing the features that uh, predicting of uh, uh, molecular uh, uh, subtypes and molecular biomarkers. Um, you know, other people have showed that you can use histologem just to show somatic mutations. We definitely, we actually have been, um, have done a lot of work in this domain in lung cancer and lung carcinoma. Uh, uh, case to actually show that you can actually identify uh, molecular biomarkers using histology images. And interestingly, there is no really known uh, morphology known to pathologists to do that. Although they have a hunch and they have been helping us to guide and identify good, you know, use cases for this um, for this uh, for this methodology. But there is not really, you know, this is not like textbook basic morphology. But yeah, this is like really interesting topic. I will be more than happy to talk more in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I I want to just look at chat and see if there is. Um, new question. I see. I don't think there's been any new questions in okay. the chat. Um, right. Do we have any more questions today? I, I've got one. So, uh, Saeed, um, you mentioned uh, uh, training. One of your last points was uh, future development on training that uses both, uh, you know, imaging data from different uh, different domains as well as mm -hmm. potentially clinical information. I, I think this is a really exciting area in. Uh, application of AI to medicine. And for anyone who practices medicine, it's kind of like, well, duh, right? That's how we practice medicine. Why would you, uh, why would you sh short the uh, model uh, crucial information for actually, uh, you know, diagnosing mm -hmm. uh, disease, et cetera? Well, what do you see as the big challenges in that area uh, that you might need to yeah. overcome? Yeah, so uh, some of the challenges this domain, especially when it comes with integration of uh, histology information with multi-omics data, is coming from uh, really a sparsity of molecular data and this high dimension. So when we are talking about, you know, genetic somatic mutations, about uh, DNA methylation, for example, you know, uh, like cap, uh, copy number variation, so on. These are very, you know, these are at the genome uh, level and it's very sparse and very large. Uh, they uh, uh, like uh, make the feature space very large. And uh, when we are talking about information extracted from histology images, we can usually use these deep, deep learning models for the like dense feature representation. And also clinical data, you know, they can, uh, they can basically, uh, 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 they can have a lot of uh, missing information that makes it very challenging. So in this domain, what we are uh, proposing and we are working on to basically using some of the uh, new novel uh, 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 language modeling and NLP work around transformers and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, generating semantic embedding to uh, generate these uh, uh, dense uh, feature representation for extracting prognostic information from multi-omics data and clinical information. So, and also we have been uh, working to not only analyze the different, you know, branches of multi-omics and clinical data separately, we want to basically model, basically model the uh, connection and uh, basically uh, common functionality and interconnected basically uh, nature of these uh, multi-omics data. This, this is uh, this is currently a challenge, and most of the work has been done is like focusing on one type of data, representing that, and then you know moving on to other one, and then you know uh, concatenating together. So we are some of the challenges in this domain combining and this like um, uh, coherent and this um, concurrent representation that we've been working on. Around missing data, we definitely can use histology images. There's a lot of work that's been done in data imputation, but we are actually, we are building um, models for data imputation using histology images. For example, I, uh, I talked earlier about how histology images can give us some clues about like molecular uh, characteristics and uh, other biomarkers, so we can use histology images that are usually available 
to um, to impute uh, genetic data that you know in some clinical settings is more rare to get. So some clinics they don't run like necessarily some genetic tests. So we can use that to generate to impute this data. So I think these are some of the challenges and opportunities that exist for combining and building this comprehensive data integration for for prognosis and for uh, for basically for better and more precise treatment of patients. Great. Yeah. I think uh, we'll probably cut it off there. I appreciate uh, your talk. It was fantastic and everyone, uh, everyone's attention and the great questions. So thank you for, uh, for uh, being here today and, and uh, enlightening us. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about my research and also your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you everyone. <laughs>